Hello, and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Robert Cataliati, who is the author of Drumsville, The Evolution of the New Orleans Beat. Robert, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thanks for having me here, Bart. Yeah, um, I got to say, so this is really cool. First off, this book is is awesome. A um, lot of people involved in it, kind of in the exhibit, and there's a foreword by Herlin Riley, which we'll, we'll talk about all that stuff. But um, I have been to the exhibit, in 2019 um, at the New Orleans Jazz Museum, which is just awesome. I got walked around and shown around by uh, Greg Lambuzi, who, who was, uh, who's who who's been on the podcast before on a previous episode about New Orleans mm-hmm. and um, mm-hmm. incredible exhibit. Um, and the book, which you guys sent me, which I'm very uh, grateful for, is just uh, wonderful. So why don't we just jump in and maybe you can just describe to people a little bit about, you know, the exhibit and the book and how they work together and kind of what you do with it and, and all that mm-hmm. good stuff. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, um, I had a dear friend who passed away. He was a musician in New Orleans named Spencer Bowren, uh, blues guitarist and singer. And in 2017, he took me to the museum to meet Greg Lambusi. Um, and at that meeting, Greg said, I, you know, I have this idea. And I had described my background as a, music historian, critic, and projects that I'd done for Smithsonian folkways and things like that. And so Greg said, yeah, I have this idea about a drum exhibit that traces the evolution of the drum set and the New Orleans beat. And I don't know if it was that day or shortly thereafter, he said, do do, do you want to help me with this? And I was like, yes, right away, yeah. (laughs) Um, And, you know, it's interesting, and, you know, again, I'm not a drummer, um, and but when he first said it, I never really thought about where did the drum set come from. It's so pervasive. Rock and roll, jazz, zydeco, polka music, reggae, you know, heavy yeah. metal, funk, every, you know, there's just a drummer on stage with the band. Um, so where did the drum set come from? And as it turns out, New Orleans is central to um, the creation of that instrument and um so eventually Greg said, uh, well, why don't you go ahead and do the start doing the research for the basis of the exhibit? And then you know, eventually he just said, well, just go ahead and do it. Just figure out what you think should be there. And so I did a series of outlines. Um, you know, I did a lot of research and ordered a bunch of books on drum sets and went over to Hogan Archive at Tulane University and Jazz and Heritage Festival Archive in the French Quarter and... Um, so I was sending these outlines to the museum um, and also the museum's um, holdings um, in their digital library. And then, um, you know, so I send the, the outlines to, to David Koonian, who's the music curator at the museum. Um, and eventually we became co-curators for the exhibit. And David comment, I have this, I have that, I have a drum set for this guy, I have a picture of so-and-so and uh you know so that's kind of we weeded it down and eventually i i uh formed it into eight parts hmm. um and yeah. uh, sent that to david were you uh, y- you're a little different than like you know person on the street because of your background with you know uh, being a music historian but were, were you aware of the importance of uh, of the drum set in the history of I'm talking before New Orleans I'm talking like cavemen the importance of drums and drum sets because sometimes when I tell people about the podcast drum history they literally laugh and go oh that's weird you know like they can't believe the importance that there would be enough to talk about <laughs> for more than well, 10 episodes I mean well yeah. you know like I said, I've been a, a music writer for over 40 years and New Orleans became a big focus for me v- for me very early on my first trip to jazz fest just i mean it sounds cliched but it totally changed my life it really did sure. um and and so writing about jazz and rhythm and blues and eventually the music of the african diaspora the caribbean and africa you know i became familiar with all these variations on african rhythms that all have drums you know central to them um, matter of fact, I was just at a um, uh, a, a tribute for um, Fela's, Fela Kuti's birthday the other night that cool. an old friend of mine that I met literally 40 years ago, Tito Sampa, who's the master drummer and dancer from the Congo, 
um, was performing there. And I met Tito's, you know, when I lived in Colorado when I was first becoming a journalist and spent a lot of time with him. And uh, so, yeah, knew about the different styles of drums and drumming. Yeah, I was definitely aware of that. Sure. Um, but the idea of the drum set never really intrigued me in terms of where did it come from until Greg said that that day. Yeah, which, I mean, I think most people who are tuned in and listening to like a show called Drum History mm -hmm. are are obsessed with it and have this kind of like you look at it and it makes you happy to just look at any drum set of any kind. But but it's it's interesting to to kind of hear that perspective of a, a music buff such as yourself. But you kind of get that. Oh, there's something different to that. I mean, it goes back really far. Um, but let's let's hop in here and talk about the evolution of the New Orleans beat, going back to Congo Square and how it all started. Okay. So, kind of yeah. take it away. Yeah. So yeah, I, you know, to me, you know, if you talk about mu music in New Orleans and really, you know, uh, American music, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the the Neville Brothers, the, the song they do, Congo Square. Um, but Cyril Neville would always introduce that song saying, we're going to take you to a place where American music was born, a place called Congo Square. And, you know, so that, 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 that's central to the whole thing, that by the early part of the 19th century, Congo Square was really the only regularly sanctioned place where people of African descent could play drums and dance traditional African rhythms. Um, and it was only allowed in New Orleans on Sunday afternoons, uh, eventually because the in the afternoon because uh, people complained about it because it was interfering with the Catholic masses going on. And finally, the bishop wrote a letter and said only after mass is over. Um, but Jeez. so these gatherings started taking place in Congo Square. But I, I would say that. As soon as African people arrived in Louisiana, which would be about 1719 um, through the Middle Passage, now, there may have been a few Africans in Louisiana um, with Spanish explorers a little bit earlier, but as soon as those Africans arrived in, through the Middle Passage, drumming was happening in Louisiana, um, sure. and it was pervasive um, and immediate, as I say in the book. Because of the importance of drumming within African culture yeah, and the spiritual significance of the, of the actual rhythms themselves you know sure um, in terms of uh, religious belief systems that the drums the rhythms can summon spiritual entities if you will um, you know eventually you have these variations in the diaspora in Cuba you have the Santeria uh, in Brazil Candomblé in um, Haiti Voodoo um, New Orleans Voodoo um, and the, and the, the rhythms from those ceremonies summon the loas or the orishas, as they're called in the different traditions. But, yeah. you know, also these African people that came, they weren't able to bring things with them on, on the Middle Passage. And so they had to re, I usually like to say it as re, R-E dash member, remember the, what, what, what their traditions were, both in terms of sure. recall, recalling them and also rebuilding them or reassembling them from the materials that they had at hand. Um, and so there's this improvisational nature that comes in African-based art that not only applies to the performance, but actually to the instruments themselves being yeah, improvised. And it's kind of neat, too, that like drums are so natural uh before so you get into synthetic heads and all that stuff but you could make it with what's found in nature around you you could create these drums animals wood you know yeah. look uh, you know I, the, the quote is in the book from um from johnny vidakovich who's you know just one of the great masters that lives in new orleans today and he says you know basically he says it hasn't changed in thousands of years. It's a wood stump with an animal skin stretched over it, and you beat it with a stick. That's yeah. the drum, you know. You know, it's basically it's that primal aspect of it, you know. And after the human voice, I would say percussion is probably the next instrument that evolved, you know. Sure. Yeah. You know, so they, so they're building these instruments and bringing them to Congo Square, um, and. Um, it's helping them to maintain an identity as African people. I think it's also important that, you know, Congo Square was um, 
there was drumming and dancing going on. It was a marketplace. You know, New Orleans had the, the free people of color in addition to enslaved African Americans who are coming there. You have Europeans that are, you know, colonists that are coming there. You have tourists coming there. You eventually have people coming from the uh, British colonies. Eventually the United States are coming there. You have Native Americans coming there. And so all this interchange is going on but the root of it is the african rhythms and and i think it's important because it was something that was all their own that was theirs yeah. you know where they had almost nothing else based on the on the yeah absolutely know. and i mean i think that in if you're in that horrible situation of being brought from your country for the sake of slavery to kind of have that it it's sort of it's sort of uh, you know, for religious purposes, like you said, but also there's probably some power to it where they were trying to do things that were like, you know, it's it's praying, it's giving them hope that this will yeah. get better oh, yeah. and using that to give keep their spirit up. Mm -hmm. Definitely that. I mean, it's that. It also gives them an outlet to critique their oppressors. Um, it creates, and, the, you know, it's communal. You know, you're talking about gatherings that range from the hundreds to possibly the thousands at one one time and and different ethnic african groups in in drum circles with these rhythms you know percolating across this open plain and today congo square has big live oaks on it but the trees were not there um you know yeah. back during the colonial era so you have all these cross rhythms going on all these different variations different drum styles you know, and we have a lot of information about it from journals, travel logs, newspaper accounts by Europeans, often at the minimum ethnocentric, often totally racist. But you can read through the the prejudice to, to get to this is what and what the drums look like, yeah. what was going on with the people that were participating. Um, you know, they yeah. definitely had the call and response pattern going on. They, they were definitely improvising and you had all these different kinds of uh, rhythms, sophisticated rhythms um, happening there. Well, I mean, it's 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 human nature, too, where it's like we are drawn to rhythm. We're drawn to music. And then there's a little bit, too, of like the um, I'm sure part of the, the, you know, the culture in, in New Orleans where, you know, they were of the you know, let's say they're white or whoever of just uh, the upper class, you know, I'm sure their kids and, and some of the women and some of the men were drawn to it, but they weren't supposed to. And I mean, that's mm -hmm. human nature to mm -hmm. be like, that's rock and roll. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm not supposed to like that. Yeah. My dad doesn't want me to like it, but I do like it. And it's loud and it's noisy and you can't not hear it. So I'm sure mm -hmm. that trickles down into everyone's, you know, yeah. subconscious. Yeah. And, you know, and at the same time, you have European music having a major presence in the city you know opera like multiple opera companies going on at one time you had classical concerts going on where and you had Af people of african descent whether they were enslaved or free people of color performing that european music particularly the balls the dances where they're doing waltzes and quadrilles and mazurkas those are all rhythms that become part of the vocabulary of new orleans music you know and right. i and i i kind of speculate like is there a guy were there guys that were playing drums at the opera or for a classical concert that on sunday afternoon went over to congo square and played the african rhythms and how much of that african derived rhythm sensibility also made its way back to the European yeah. uh, venue, venues, you know? Yeah, I mean, so to, to, to kind of dig deeper into that, so what you're saying, though, is, is like the people, like African musicians would be performing with those traditional uh, European, like, operas and classical performances. There was... Definitely Afri people of African descent, either enslaved or free people of color, performing in the European concert venues. Interesting. And, and both groups, this, the enslaved and the free people of color, could attend many of those venues in um, segregated seating um, up above uh, the, the orchestra. 
um, you know, I found an a, a interview with Baby Dodds where he talked about the, the traditional jazz drummer from the, you know, really the, the, the father of the, yeah. j- the drum set, um, said growing up he would go to the, to the um, Toulouse Theater and stand, he wasn't allowed in. And then, because New Orleans became more segregated after slavery was over with the Reconstruction, um, but he would stand outside in in the vestibule of the theater and listen to opera and listen to classical music. And said he, he said he took that back and brought that conception, that orchestral conception, to his drum set, which is a characteristic of a lot of New Orleans drummers. Talk about playing melodically and and playing um, the, the melody and, and um, compositionally and structurally fall, rather than just keeping a beat, you know? I mean, this is like, in some ways not related at all, in some ways completely related. I just did an episode about uh, the biography of Keith Moon, you know, famous wild man drummer, but he was famous for... Uh, playing kind of more uh, Tony Fletcher, who was on it, described him as playing. He would play the lead parts on the drums and mm-hmm. the melodies, mm-hmm. but he was influenced by a lot of early jazz drummers in mm-hmm. America. Mm-hmm. So it's it's weird how you can honestly draw that back to that doing yeah. that kind of style way yeah. back, way back a- across mm-hmm. different continent mm-hmm. to this type of situation. Yeah, I, I think that's true. Yeah. Can we just check in real quick and say what year are we talking for like Congo Square and all of this happening? Like what, you know? Well, I would say the, the probably the 1820s, 1830s. Okay. The, it it kind of seems to have died out. And then there's a newspaper account of uh, um, a, a, another uh, the opportunity for, for Africans to play only in the summer with written permission from their... Uh, white masters that comes kind of around the eight, late 1850s and then from what I can tell it's it's over by the Civil War um, gotcha. one one account I read said when the Union Army occupied New Orleans it stopped which is kind of ironic but it did, you know yeah, um, that is that is uh, um, um, but anyway yeah so the first half of the 19th century Okay, let's switch over and talk about um, I have written down improvisation because before, I mean, like you said, with, you know, we're talking classical music and things are very Mm -hmm. written and we're using, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. notation. Yeah. You think jazz, you think New Orleans, you think improvising and freedom. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about improvisation. Yeah. So, you know, um, I I think, you know, for years I taught African-American literature and African-American culture and one of the things I always like to ground those traditions in is that there are cultural retentions that people of African descent have that form the building blocks of African American expression, African retentions that become African American. And so I, the three major components to me of that oral tradition because it primarily we're talking about an oral tradition right passed down by word of mouth yeah um is call and response that that pattern of a leader in dialogue with a group um is pervasive throughout all the different regions of africa um uh improvisation as an approach to performance as opposed to as you said european which is much more you know the static text or the authority you know if you you know, I, I taught in an English department, so I dealt with Shakespeare scholars, and you know, they're they're often their big thing is, is it the authoritative version of the text? There's a primacy based on that in Western art, right? You know, Beethoven's symphonies, you play them the way they're written. You know, you're not going to add a little flavor here. You know, <laughs> if you're in the orchestra, right? Where in African-based art. There's a primacy, you have a, a basic text that you improvise on and show what you can do with it. So there's that improvisational nature of performance. And then the third component to me would be the rhythmic sophistication. I mean, in Europe, European music, harmony is really the dominant element, but in African-based music, rhythm is. And so that, and that improvisation not only extends from, it's, extends from performance to actually what you're playing on. So these guys, these these African people are building drums and shakers and rattles and bells from whatever they can 
find in colonial Louisiana. And then that, that tradition of improvising percussion instruments, to me, re-manifests itself in the 19th century in New Orleans in what's called the spasm bands. Mostly young boys playing on homemade instruments on the streets of the city. So I think it's probably somewhat comes from that African cultural heritage. It also, you could think about it as that kind of, you know, what you call the Yankee can-do spirit, right? And, uh, you know, I th when I thought, because I, I said I taught African-American literature for years, it reminded me of these, these guys, these, these people creating these instruments out of things that are cast aside, found yeah. objects, right? That reminded me in the, in the novel Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison, um, where the, the narrator um, considers himself a thinker tinker. He has a concept and he acts on it, right? And so, you know, these people were thinker tinkers and like Ellison's narrator, many of them were invisible, that is, willfully ignored yeah. by the main society. And, and they yeah. created possibility out of their invisibility. You know, so one of the things that I loved was um, the, I found the, there's a, a DVD that came out about two, two three years ago called Fess Up. Um, and it's an uh, interview with Professor Longhair that was used for the, um, the interview was for the film Piano Players Rarely Ever Play Together. I don't know if you're familiar with that film. No. Uh, it was a film done in the 70s, and he actually, Professor Longhair died while the film was being made. It was bringing him together with Toots Washington and Alan Toussaint. And um, the interview was for the background sections of that film. And so a few years ago, the producers put the whole... Um, video out. It's about an hour long of Fess sitting at the piano at Tipitina's, um, just talking. And wow. he narrates how he was a, he, Fess was a drummer and um, of course he's known as a piano master, but uh, he was a drummer and he, he narrates in detail building a spasm drum kit from wooden boxes, uh, the, the tin um, canisters, real canisters from movie movie reels and tin cans and how he made a little ad hoc drum pedal with a piece of leather and a rubber ball and things like that that improvisational spirit the washboard as as a percussion instrument you know there's an everyday object sure um you know in new orleans today uh, another old friend of mine who moved here is washboard Chaz Leary, who's just the absolute master of the washboard. I mean, I, I always call him the, the Max Roach of the washboard. <laughs> uh, you know, it's a washboard. He's got a wood block hanging off it. He's got two tin cans on it and a little hotel desk clerk bell. Um, and, you know, he can do sophisticated solos. He can play bebop. He can play, you know, country blues, whatever. Yeah. Um, but that spirit, that that's what's going on here. And you have... That, that especially with percussion instruments, you know? Yeah. Shakers made out of tin cans with beans in them or pebbles or, you know, and then you have the Mardi Gras Indians that come along at the same time where they're using tambourines and they're using glass bottles with sticks. I mean, there's a, a video that Alan Lomax made in New Orleans called, I think it's called Feats Don't Fail Me Now. And uh, he's got some Mardi Gras Indian practice video in there where they're on the, out on the corner and they're actually got a stick and they're playing the side of a shotgun house. They're beating the rhythm out on the side. Of, and then they turn the house into a drum, you know. That's amazing. Uh, you know, so that yeah. is that whole spirit there of this creating these instruments out of what you have. You know, you use yeah. what you got, as Washboard Chaz said to me. Um, and so percussionists start doing that. You know, so the other, I guess, thread we need to bring in here is the other major and probably the biggest European influence in New Orleans is the militia bands that come in, that are originally drums and fife, and then they start to be, um, you know, they start to have brass instruments, and then later on, they, a clarinet and uh, reed instruments come into it. But that introduces the, you know, the, the brass bands have originally three percussionists, the, the militia bands, the cymbal player, the bass drummer, and the snare drummer. At some point, the cymbal gets attached to the bass drum. 
Yep. Um, and as Stanton Moore keeps, you know, he's such a advocate for New Orleans drumming. Um, oh yeah, he's just like, you know, there goes another gig for a drummer. <laughs> There's the, <laughs> the the cymbal players out of the band, and of course, <laughs> once the drum the bass pedal gets, there goes another drum gig for somebody. Exactly. You know? But you know, so they attach the cymbal to the bass drum, and now you have two drummers, um, and then um, you know they're marching. Right. And that whole uh, second line phenomenon in New Orleans, what they call the big four, where, you know, they hit the bass drum and the cymbal drum on the fourth beat that Wynton Marsalis credits to Buddy Bolden as an innovation. Um, And the idea that that's where the lilt or the, the swing or the lift comes in New Orleans rhythm. So they're doing that as they parade and, and people are dancing these free form second line dances, but they also start getting gigs indoors. Um, and so the idea is it's more confined space. Can we get by with only one drummer? And so sure. this concept of double drumming comes along where the, they put a snare drum on a, on a chair and now you have one guy playing cymbal bass and um, snare drum. So we're, which is that, that's the drum set yeah and that's the, that's the innovative spirit the improvisational spirit and then you get which to me is the, he's the i always call him the star of the drumsville exhibit is um dd chandler in that um photo from the 1890s with the john robichaux orchestra where you know it's an eight-piece band and there's only one drummer and it's dd his snare drum is on the ground in front of him his bass drum is right in front of him with the cymbal attached to it. And then hanging over on the, the side of the drum is this overhanging or swing improv. I mean, he built it himself, handmade bass drum pedal. Um, that I also found a description of the detail of that construction from the musicologist Samuel Charters in one of his New Orleans books. Talks about, you know, using, he, he, he worked in a grocery store, Dee Dee. Um, and so he had a milk box and, you know, stuff that he got from work. Stuart Copeland has a really cool uh, documentary that I'll put a link to in the, in the description. But he kind of builds one, the overhang pedal, uh-huh. and uh, uses this technology, which which even now you see him build it. And you're kind of like, God, how does your brain go to, to do this and yeah. hang it and do this? And it's because now we take everything as drummers and musicians. We take everything for granted as We've already seen it, so we know how mm-hmm. to do it. Mm-hmm. He didn't see it. He yeah. didn't know how to do it. No right. one was doing it. You weren't right. hitting. It. You were hitting the bass drum right. with a, a mallet. So yeah. you know, from from my understanding, and and Stanton helped me with this uh, quite a bit um, because he's such a scholar of drums too. Um, there were patents for bass drum pedals in even in Europe. Yes. Before D. D. Chandler, I mean, there were designs for them, but we don't have any evidence that they were used. The, the John Robichaux picture is the first extant picture of a working drummer, a New Orleans drummer, using a bass drum pedal. And then the other, yeah. another cool thing we have in the exhibit is, and it's in the book too, a picture of it is this, this uh, uh, drummer named, his brass band drummer named Papa Jack Lane, who apparently was a blacksmith as well as being a drummer, built an overhang pedal, swing pedal, um, that was over at the Hogan Archive at Tulane University. Um, and uh, their, one of their music archivists, Lynn Abbott, said, you know, this thing, we've never even cataloged it. Um, but it's been just under the desk here. And he just kind of reached down and said, would you want to use this? <laughs> and it's like one of the most important things yeah, in like yeah. music. musical. Yeah. I mean, because again, you, you think it's, I don't know, to an outsider, uh, they might think it's silly. Who cares about that? But that is the, the beat yeah. of every right. song. It's huge. It's, and, of course, the bass drum. Or, and I just want to mention also then that, um, so by 1909, William Ludwig creates that first bass drum pedal, which we have one of those 1909 Ludwig pedals yeah. that belongs to Stanton Moore. He lent it to us. And um, so there, then, then it just takes off. Then you yeah. have the drum set is now possible. Um, I believe there was a man named Ulysses Leeds. UG Le- Leedy. Leedy. He designed a uh, snare drum stand. Yeah. And um, so then you're on your way. You know, you have the snare drum stand, the bass drum pedal, the cymbal can hang from a T 
you know, a T mount or it could be mounted on the on the bass drum. Um, yeah. And then the final piece is um, another New Orleans connection. Um, Baby Dodds is playing on the riverboat, uh, and Ludwig comes on the William Ludwig comes on the boat and says uh, he notices Baby Dodds stomps with his left foot and says, "Can you stomp with your toe rather than your heel?" And Baby Dodds said, yeah, "I think so." Um, and so he did some measurements. He measured Baby Dodd's foot. He measured the space between his foot and the bass drum. And he comes back with a prototype for what's first called a low boy, um, yep. which is basically the hi hat. And it didn't work. And Baby Dodd said no. And then he raised it up um, eight inches or whatever, brought sure. it back. It worked, but Baby Dodd's hated it and never wanted to have anything to do with it again, which is. You know, yeah. he would have been, but it, of course, by the time we get to the 1930s, you know, Papa Joe Jones with the Basie band, you know, creates, makes the hi-hat just so central to the whole kit, but. This episode is brought to you by Pocket Percussion in Willow Grove, Pennsylvania, right outside of Philly. They cater their inventory to suit everyone, including beginners who need a great affordable starter drum set up to professionals who need specific new or vintage gear. Pocket Percussion sells used gear, stands, cymbals, Custom drums, snares, hand percussion, vintage gear, plus hard to find parts and everyday necessities. In addition to buying, selling, and taking trades, he also does great repairs and reheading. Learn more at pocket percussion.com and keep up with their newest gear on Instagram and Facebook at Pocket Percussion. Yeah, and the, the hi hat, I was going to say, uh, you know, let's let's not go down that road too far because that is such a debated. I mean, there's there's who invented it first. There's I have an episode with Rob Cook, who's a great historian who brought in uh, Skip Rutherford, who had inventions and stuff. But but there was the sock symbol. There was the Charleston symbol. Yeah. There was the low boy. There was it was like it's almost like um, it's just like things were just going to happen. Yeah. Like they, they needed the right people to test it. And, and it's neat to see these pictures. But even looking at photos of like Baby Dodds uh, with Kid Ori's original uh, that, that Creole bass jazz drum. band. Bass drum's huge. I mean, it's up to his chest. But also the snare is like so far off to the side. Yeah. It, and it's like it's it just takes refinement. Uh, but again, you you we've all had that in our lives where you do something that's you're just used to doing it until someone kind of says, oh, do it like this. Yeah. Yeah. And then, oh, well, that was easier. <laughs> yeah. You know, and then they start adding all the, you know, what they call contraptions. Yes. Wood blocks, bells, Chinese or Taiko tom uh, tom tom drums, yep. All, all that, which some people suggest is where the term trap drums comes from. Although I've heard contradicting stories about where trap drums comes from, but yeah, I mean contraption is typically the like accepted, yeah. you yeah. know. Uh, yeah. And 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 let's jump in here a little bit. Is when was this starting to leak out of New Orleans to the rest of the world? The rest of the country, at least. You know, yeah, really in broader American culture, you have the, the, the great migration taking place where African Americans are leaving the South and they're moving in, you know, massive numbers to northern cities for to escape the oppressive history of the American South and for opportunity. And so, you know, you have um, you know, King Oliver going on the riverboat first and then going to Chicago and then Louis follows him. And then Baby Dodds follows him, and then Paul Barberin makes the same trip, and Zudi Singleton makes the same trip. So 1920s, um, and then you have these, you know, you got three drummers there in Chicago. You have Paul Barberin, Baby Dodds, and Zudi Singleton, you know, blowing these people, just like Bix Beiderbeck is being blown away by Louis Armstrong. Yeah. You know, the drummers are being blown away by these guys coming from New Orleans that are doing something that's never been done before. I mean, really kind of like pioneers, you know? Yeah. Well, let me just, one thing I think is important, because you mentioned it and kind of we went on another direction, but that bass drum orientation yeah. is so important in New Orleans music. You know, as Herlin says, Herlin Riley says, from the bottom up is the way we think about it. And, you know, this, I'm not going to quote it exactly right, but um, uh, a young drummer today who's up in New York from New Orleans, Joe Dyson, um, you know, he talks about the, the, the groove inhabits the kind of lower end of the, 
the drum and I'm like, wow, I love the way he's like personifying the groove is like inhabiting somewhere in the lower frequencies of the drum set, you know. Um, But that whole focus on the bass drum and of course playing the big four on the bass drum, you know, is the New Orleans sound and, and, you know, that morphs by the time you get to the swing era, you know, where it's with a it goes to the hi hat and the ride cymbal where they're where they're keeping time up there. But the bass drum is where the you know the New Orleans thing and it's coming out of those parades. Like so many young drummers talk about just or, or drummers talk about when they were young, you could hear that bass drum coming, you know, yeah. when the parades were coming. And that's yeah. you know, that's the key there. That, well, that it's a march. Well, yeah, I mean, it's yeah. to make people march. And yeah. I, I had the pleasure yeah. of seeing jo, uh, Joe Lasty and uh, Walter Harris at Preservation Hall performing mm-hmm. when I was there. Yeah, and man, it's just this like it makes your body move a certain way where mm-hmm. you're you're moving forward, you're kind of chugging, but you're also they're kind of like it's a sway to it. I mean, there's yeah. just it's it's like nothing else. Yeah, yeah, it's it's absolutely unique to this city and. You know, it's it's you you can recognize it much easier than you can describe it in words. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's kind of ineffable in some ways. It's because it's yeah. got that spirit thing that goes back to Congo Square. You know, yeah. even, even the you know I, I, the the um, spiritual thing is really important. I think um, the the picture in that opens the book of the Saint Philip Church of God in Christ which features a number of women there's a bass drum there's a snare drum there's a there's a cymbals and there's a tambourine um and they're playing these rhythms in this this little church on saint philip street which is directly across the street from congo square where the original congo square was which today is armstrong park one of the things i loved about that picture is that the history of that church by the 19th, that picture was taken in the 1950s by a, a famous modernist artist named Ralston Crawford. He was an p- abstract painter and he was also a photographer and he moved to New Orleans and somehow the, the city was extremely segregated, but somehow he gained access to African-American culture here and took so many great pictures, jazz and otherwise. Um, and he took this picture in this church. But by the 1960s, Shannon Powell, as a little boy, moves into the house next door. His aunt and grandmother lived there. And he still lives in that house today. And, wow. um, but he, as a little boy, he heard those rhythms, uh, that spiritual rhythm from that church. And he started going in there. And that's where he learned to play tambourine. And that was his first experiences on the drum set were in that church. Um, and that's really where, you know, he, his initiated, because he's such a great in the pocket drummer. Um, and Herlin has the same experience out and Joe Lasty, Herlin and Joe Lasty are cousins, right? Their grandfather had a spiritual church out in the ninth ward. Um, and Frank Deacon, Frank Lasty was in the, uh, youth home with Louis Armstrong. You know, Louis Armstrong was sent to this uh, colored waifs home. Uh, he was ar- uh, arrested for shooting off a pistol to celebrate, I don't know if it was New Year's Eve or Fourth of July, but he, and that's where he got his first cornet lessons in that home. Hmm. Deacon Frank Lasty was in the home with him. Um, and so his first <laughs> yeah. musical training was in that home. But when Frank Lasty gets out uh, and, and goes out into the world in New Orleans, his focus is not on jazz, but on the church. And he is the one who introduced drums to the spiritual church. Um, and that's where Herlin and Joe Lasty, um, you know, had their initial experiences. So that spiritual dimension, you know, that that's communicated through the drums is really important to New Orleans yeah. music also, you know. One thing I want to also mention, too, is... Um Going back when we were talking about the improvisation um, of building instruments, just putting things together, kind of just, you know, using what you can to find things. And you talked about people making shakers and all these kind of things. Um, when my experience in New Orleans and and seeing, uh, you know, things about Mardi Gras Indians and all this kind of things was it's like many, many percussionists with all these different small instruments get put together to make one larger unit. 
Yeah. So you're you're not like building, and and I mean, obviously the drum set kind of shrunk that, yeah. but like you would say, oh, I found this uh, this little like washboard. I found this part of fencing that I can scratch on. Mm-hmm. It's like that doesn't sound great by itself. It could sound really cool, but it seems like it's a very communal. Let's. I'm gonna make this. This will be my thing. You take that can and put something in it. You take this. Very communal. Very yeah, for the greater definitely. good of the music. Yeah, I, you know, and I brought that up with uh, because there's also a a, a a a community of drummers here, and one of the things that I learned from doing this project is that they taught each other. You know, there's there there seems to be, you know, I read an interview with Ed Blackwell, the great modern jazz drummer and free jazz innovator who did so much you know uh, groundbreaking work with Arnett Coleman um and he talks about like you know he said in, in New York you go to visit somebody and they're practicing they stop because they don't want you to, to get their stuff he said here sure. you know it would be okay man sit down let's play this together and this is a lot of stories in the book about drummers teaching each other um, and and playing together, um, and you know, and that, and I want to mention that to Adonis Rose, who's a comes from a family of his father and his grandfather were both professional drummers here. His, his father still his father's the snare drummer in uh, uh, Treme Brass Band, Vern, Vernon Severin. Um, but he said, yeah, well, think back to Congo Square. There were, you know, groups of drummers, of hundreds of drummers playing together. So, of course, there's that. Y- your job is to make other people sound good and to make each other sound good. You know, there's that that's communal kind of spirit um, yeah. that's really important in New Orleans drumming. That thing you mentioned, also another thing I, that I read from Blackwell was when he, you know, he, he, he was the drummer for the pianist Randy Weston for many years. And he went to live in Africa with Randy Weston in the 1960s. Um, And he said he noticed when he would watch traditional African drumming that he would walk around the group and see that each guy was playing something that was basically very simple. But when you put it together, it had this incredible complexity to it. And he said it reminded him of the cats in New Orleans when they would play together. You know, sure. Yeah. It's a very special uh, – New Orleans is just a special place in general. I mm-hmm. mean, it's just the, mm-hmm. the culture and the people. And in, from my experience with the whole thing, which I talked about years ago on the podcast, of going and hanging out with Stanton Moore and seeing the Rolling Stones and meeting Charlie Watts and uh, going to Preservation Hall, truly one of the best you know trips of my life. You can't mm-hmm. really – that yeah, will never be recreated. 2019? <laughs> yes. 2019, yeah. yeah. You know, Char- Charlie came to Drumsville. Um, when we, in 2019, he was, they were supposed to, the Stones were supposed to play the Jazz and Heritage Festival that spring and something happened with Mick Jagger's health and, uh, Charlie's drum tech, Don McCauley, uh, had been in touch with Greg and, um, when they came back, they did the, they had, they were rebooked for the Superdome that July, um, McCauley called Greg and there was Hurricane Barry was coming, yep. um, so the city was shut down, but, uh, we opened the museum, Greg, I, and a couple of the young women who work at the museum and brought Charlie in and, you know, he spent the whole afternoon and just studied that exhibit. And, you know, I tried to narrate it for him, but basically everything I said, he said, yeah, I know, you yeah. know, like he, he, yeah. he really is a scholar of, and so, so cool to have him there. But, you know, talk about the reach of New Orleans drumming, how far it's gone. Um, yes. We talked about Baby Dodds going to uh, Chicago and revolutionizing, you know, introducing how this this is the instrument and this is how we play it. Now you guys can take it further, right? And those innovations that happened outside New Orleans were absorbed by New Orleans drummers, but New Orleans drummers also kept innovating. You know, so like I said, so you had Blackwell. I mean, he's pioneering free jazz drumming. I mean, that's that's yeah. huge. And, you know, I, I, one of the things I found is that, you know, Ornette Coleman was here in the early 50s. He was stranded because he got fired because the band didn't like, you know, he's trying to do some of his free stuff. And he hung out with the Lasty family um, and um, met Blackwell. And that's really where the concept of free jazz drumming developed. And then eventually... 
Blackwell and Ellis Marsalis and Harold Batiste went to Los Angeles to play with Ornette. So Ornette makes mm. his big, big splash. He's got Billy Higgins on drums on the first album, and then he goes to New York to the five spot. But then, you know, for whatever reason, Billy Higgins can't get a, you know, what they used to call a cabaret card to play in the places that sell alcohol in New York City. Sure. Um, so a lot of the times you got the sense, people say like, well, Ornette call, called Blackwell to come fill in for Billy Higgins, you know, take Billy Higgins' place. But really, Blackwell was coming to take his gig back. I mean, he was the one that was the first with mm. Ornette, you know. So anyway, you know, but th- those kind of innovations went on with New Orleans drummers yeah, uh, through the years. Um, yeah, for sure. And one thing before I forget, I want to mention, too, because we're just talking about Charlie Watts. That's just the perfect example of how uh, obviously he was way, I mean, that was close to his death. I mean, that was uh, two years before mm-hmm, he passed mm-hmm, away, mm-hmm. very uh, sadly. But so talking way, way, uh, you know, earlier in his life and earlier in this interview, when you were talking about spasm bands, it's a direct correlation to the British, like the skiffle groups. Right. They're making their instruments out of, you know, washboards wash tubs and, and, yeah, wash wash tubs and bass yeah, and things. Yeah. And, you know, it's like, that's a great, I'm sure they're influenced by all that New Orleans Hello. sound and... <laughs> Yeah, you know, you know, when you start doing research on a certain topic, you know, you, things just kind of fall in place sometimes. So, you know, when I was initially working on the um, outline for the drum exhibit for Greg, you know, I I, I subscribed to this um, uh, rock music magazine called Goldmine, right? It's like a collector's rock magazine. They had Ringo Starr on the cover, right? And yeah. so the interview with Ringo is. The, qu- the question is, what rock bands did you hear in Liverpool before the Beatles? And he said, none, because there weren't any. But I remember two shows, Sister Rosetta Tharp and the George Lewis Band from New Orleans. And he said he had a drummer, and that guy showed me what a drum kit was supposed to be. He said he only had a <laughs> bass drum, a snare drum, and a cymbal. And when he wanted to play the Tom Phil's, he leaned down and played him on the bass drum. And he said, that guy showed me a, taught me a lesson. And he said, you'll never see Ringo play a 15-piece drum set because I learned it from that guy. And I was yeah. like, okay, who is that guy? Right. So I really started asking Herlin. I asked Stanton. I went over to Tulane and asked um, Lynn Abbott, the, who was the archivist over there. And then finally I realized that George Lewis, who had a huge uh, – extended career in the traditional jazz revival, used the same drummer for over a decade. And his name was Joe Watkins. And uh, so I found the name. He was a traditional jazz drummer in New Orleans. And later on in his life, he played at Preservation Hall. But when I was searching for him in uh, the archive photos, I find this photo of Joe Watkins on a train on his way to Liverpool to play the gig that Ringo saw him play at. And if you think about it, that was 1959. Five years later, Ed Sullivan, February 1964, that Ludwig set with the Drop T Beetle logo up on that riser. You know, the next day, more drum kits were sold than any other day probably in history. of people want You know, and so, and it can be traced directly back to Joe Watkins and the New Orleans beat, you know? Mm. And, and I really so cool. I, I wonder, you know, did, did Joe Watkins probably had no clue when he got back <laughs> on that train of how far he had extended the reach of that New Orleans beat, you know? Yeah. You know? I think that's true, though, of, um, you know, for you, like, music historian, professor, me doing the podcast, you never know who's listening. You never know who hears it and gets mm-hmm, influenced. Mm-hmm, Obviously, mm-hmm. I'm not comparing us to the Beatles on Ed Sullivan uh-huh. uh, changing the world. But yeah. it's it's really yeah. important, though, yeah. that just everything you do. I mean, sure, that was just like, you know, uh, he, obviously, he was probably excited to be overseas you know playing in liverpool but Mm -hmm. you just you never know man and it's yeah it all trickles back i think that's the importance of new orleans and the reason why people should study it and Mm -hmm. know more about it because i think there's still lots of secrets Mm -hmm. in new orleans and the music and to learn it from it um Mm -hmm. where should people go to check out the exhibit 
The New Orleans Jazz Museum is in the old U.S. Mint. You know, it was actually a, a mint in the 19th century there. It's become the Jazz Museum. The Drumsville, when, when, I, when Greg asked me to, to do the exhibit, he said, yeah, we'll probably have it up for about three months. And so here we are four years later. Yeah, and something I'm like that. currently working with um, David Coonian, the music curator, and one of the curatorial assistants, Adrian Bird. The three of us are re- revamping the exhibit to, um, I guess, better reflect the, the contents of the book. Um, and so we're doing that. Um, it, it's going to be ready by mid-December. We'll have another opening night, opening night part two. Um, and so, and there's other great, so many other great exhibits at the museum. Um, then currently there's a big Louis Prima exhibit there. Um, there's a small uh, exhibit to Danny Barker. There's a photo exhibit to uh, Monk Boudreaux um, on the Golden Eagle Indian tribe. Um, so it's really a, a very cool exhibit. It's right on the edge of the French Quarter, right behind the um, French Market. And then, of course, the book is on sale um, from LSU Press and also on Amazon and other bookstores. Like if there's still bookstores out there. Yeah. <laughs> um, but and, yeah. you know, and you know, we, we there's a lot more to the book than what we what we've talked about. Um, yes. Profiles of. So many influential drummers. One of the things that both about the book and the exhibit that has kind of stressed me out a little bit is that just by their very nature of being an exhibit or a book, space is limited. Um, So I always say both the exhibit and the book are representative rather than comprehensive because there's so many other drummers um, that should be included that aren't um sure so you know there's profiles of baby dodds and zooty singleton and lewis barberin and Sai frazier and frank lasty and ray baduke another very interesting character from the bob crosby orchestra um you know a big star in the 1930s like gene krupa or buddy rich or somebody like that sure. um and he was a solid new orleans drummer and yeah yeah, that's interesting because, um, and I mean, this is like something, you know, they're throwing in right cl- close to the end, but like you you do, there's like an uh, African-American drummer kind of uh, connotation that goes sometimes with the New Orleans feel, uh-huh. but there's a lot of great uh, drummers like, you know, who would be white guys like Ray Baduk and then obviously Stanton Moore, who's great, and many, many more. Uh, you got to have Johnny, Johnny Vodakovich in there. You yes. Know? And, and the other thing that struck me and this, we're, we're working on this, and I tried to deal with this, is that women are now drummers in New Orleans. Like, you know, so much of the the drum exhibit starts with that St. Philip picture, right, of those women in that church. And you don't get any more women in the narrative until the the last part of the exhibit, the extensions and variations. And not that they weren't drumming here, um, because they were drumming in churches. There, there were women drumming in uh, marching bands for carnival parades. There were women drumming in yep. stage bands in the public schools and things like that. But I, I really wanted to make a, a concerted effort to acknowledge the women that are up. You know, I called it. It's about time. You know that women really got recognized. And sure. and, and and the profiles are really interesting. The women's stories are really interesting. And and um, you know, and and they, a lot of their their drumming is similar is is the same drumming that we're talking about but their stories are totally because you know drumming is very male dominated so um you know they're up against now she's a woman she really can't be because i guess there's this perceived physicality sometimes about drumming but i think the the six profiles that i have in the book show that that's certainly not the case yeah, and it's interesting. I just opened right to. I'm, I hope I say it right. Mayumi Shara, Shara. Yeah. yeah. When she said, uh, "There's a picture here." She says, "When I saw a picture of Baby Dodds playing his drum set with a Tyco Tom Tom, I was like, wow, that Tom is from my culture in the Far East.' It's pretty crazy. I mean, it really does. It's just like, where does it end? The, yeah. The, yeah. The influence. Yeah. That, and you know, her journey to New Orleans. I mean, she can't. She wanted to be a jazz. She was a Tyco drummer. A traditional Japanese drummer, um, and she uh, wanted to be a jazz drummer, and people refused to teach her in Japan. You know, they just said, no, 
I, the line was, I don't have a vision of a, I don't have an image of a woman drummer, a jazz drummer. And she says, I will change your image. You know? <laughs> yeah. Good. You know? Good. Which I, I think we all need to make a concerted effort of, of that. I mean, it is the drum drums typically are a, uh, when you visualize it, people think men and there's so many great female drummers. And, um, I think it's cool that you had that included in the exhibit and the book and and i will put all the links for it in the description per usual but i just got to tell people and i hope people trust me at this point that i i, I gotta say this book is like a coffee table book that anyone can open up the quality of it you know there's a lot of great books that i've reviewed and stuff that are kind of i don't know even more smaller novel type books but this thing is like a it would. It looks cool in your like living room on your table. I mean, it's 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 got a it's got a feel to it, man. I mean, this is it, it's great. Yeah, the the LSU Press did a fantastic job with it, and the the art designer was just beautiful work. Just really, I was beyond my wildest dreams to be to be honest with you. And you know, there's yeah. over a hundred, I think, a hundred and thirty pictures in the book, and. Um, you know, some of them are very, very rare pictures that haven't been seen before. Some of them are famous pictures, but it's a compelling story. Very Whether much. you're a drummer or not, really, you know. Yeah, a music fan. Yeah. Any music yeah. fan would, would yeah. should if, appreciate if, it. If, 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 if you go to Jazz Fest and you like the music you hear at Jazz Fest, you'll like this book. Yes, you know? that's a good way to put it. Awesome. Well, Bob, this has been really, really cool. So I want to, um, before we wrap up, I want to first off, I want to tell people that if they like this, there is another episode, episode 38, way back from February 2020. Um, it's the episode of the pot of my show is it's called New Orleans Jazz History with Stanton Moore, Walter Harris, Joe Lasty and Greg Lambuzi. And that is a cool episode where I got to hang out at um, Stanton Moore's studio space. And it was one of the only ones I've actually recorded live in person. The rest of them are all like this. But um, people can check that out. I'll put a link in the description. Um, but big thank you to Greg Lambuzi for getting us connected and uh, just kind of being a good guy. And he's always kind of an ally. Um in many regards, uh, David Cunian, uh, obviously for his help, but Bob, thank you for my pleasure. Getting in touch. Really. I appreciate you doing this. It's great. I love talking about it and turning people on to this. Oh, it's so cool. So, um, uh, everyone listening, Bob is kind enough. He's going to hang out and we're going to do a Patreon bonus episode. And this is a cool one, uh, a little different from drumming, uh, but still drum related. We're going to talk about, um, Dr. John, who's a great new Orleans musician ambassador kind of promoter of all things new orleans especially the drummers um and uh just awesome i love dr john so i'm excited to talk about that so if you want to hear that go to patreon.com slash drum history podcast or go on my website and you can find it uh, and bob's episode will be there and um also like i think 70 other bonus episodes as well so um, well, Bob, my friend, thank you so much for doing this. And uh, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you today. Well, thank you for taking the time.